Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 292 for Monday, April 8th, 2024. This is a podcast all about Minecraft, available across all of the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please consider subscribing wherever you're listening to this. My name is Joel Duggan, and joining me, as always, is my friend Johnny. But of course, you may know him better as Pixel Riffs on the interwebs. Hello, sir. Hello, and someone else you might know from the interwebs is joining us today. We are excited to be joined by Minecraft game designer Ulrath. We've already been chatting on the render distance where we've been talking about the eclipse and getting jump scared by trees. The render distance is the extended version of the podcast, available exclusively for patrons who support the show at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. When he's not at the day job, you can find Ulrath streaming Minecraft at twitch.tv slash Ulrath, being a snappy dresser and occasionally eating bamboo, allegedly. <laughs> Ulrath, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> hello hello that's a great introduction <laughs> thank you very much yes the uh the tales of whether or not you ate bamboo are legendary in certain uh, circles and uh yes. yeah i mean to be fair you did get it programmed into one april fool's uh exactly. snapshot and so th there is now official proof of of bamboo having been eaten um yes. but uh as usual when we start up one of these shows we like to log in and take a quick look at what's new in our minecraft lives and the guests go first obviously there may be some stuff you're not able to talk about but Ulraf, mm. what's new for you in minecraft ah yeah um so i think unfortunately i haven't been playing that much uh minecraft recently i think work has been a bit stressful the wrapping up the update and all the new features and the base and everything was a bit stressful uh, but I think I still get to play sometimes. I have this uh, mobile world that I play quite a lot on in the last year. It's very, very small survival place. I started building, um, like I always play it on the way to stuff. So I tried to have builds that don't require as much thought. So what I started to do is just have uh, huge structures that represent uh animals so i have a huge chicken and i have that i host my chicken farm and i have a huge cow where the cow farm is and of course i have a huge panda where where i sleep and it's my house um, <laughs> and stuff like that it's really nice and i think it's it's been a very nice humbling experience because i'm so not used to the mobile uh, touch controls that i uh yeah i went back to doing some simple stuff all of these are made of different kinds of woods because I don't really have complicated blocks yet. And I, I die every time I try to go into a cave. And like so much of my food is just fishing. Because even chasing down an animal to kill it is hard. <laughs> like it's it's yeah, it's been a very humbling, interesting experience going back to, to the roots. Uh, I'm looking forward when I evolve that a bit and start making farms. Because again, I want to feel like I'm really knowledgeable about the difference in different farms. The difference in redstone, different in mechanics. So I'm looking looking forward to that. Some of the uh, pre-show chat we had was about your adventures in mobile, uh, some of the more embarrassing deaths, uh, but also yep. the, the philosophy behind it and the fact that you feel like as a Java main for however long, you've uh, kind of felt like you need to dip into the, the other side of the game and build up a knowledge base of that. So I think that's a, exactly. a really admirable uh, sentiment. The, the other thing I know you've done recently, because I was also part of it, is the poisonous potato update, which mm. we managed to cover in the show last week. The news broke basically right as we were starting the show so we were able to read the news about it but i was not quite prepared <laughs> and apparently <laughs> neither were you because yep, you hadn't yep. really had much of a hand in in some of the uh the april fool snapshot stuff so uh tell, tell us a little bit about that um did you did you then go around sending like uh nasty emails to people saying like why did you, why did you make this feature uh, or did you have any like compliments to anybody about like the flotator and and like what what surprised you the most about that snapshot yeah i think uh, i think one of the things that surprised me the most was just the volume of things i think they did an amazing job with sort of filling up a, a really fun dimension and uh, it's always like uh, mix mixed feelings of seeing how much we can get done when when it's sort of some of the restrictions are lifted right uh, and I, th I think the community sort of reacted the same way by seeing all this i i think it's important to note that no one wants i i no one really would want us to develop this way right the amount of bugs would go through the roof the amount <laughs> of depth for features would go down but i think it's still it's still a good sort of um how do you say is that a, an English saying? Candle to our leg? No, uh, that's not an English saying. A, a, a thing to to aspire to. It, I think in Hebrew you say a candle to 
watch for or something like that if you translate it. So it's mm-hmm. something to watch, it's something to have as a vision. This is where we want to be. We want things to be this fast. So we need to keep improving our ways of working and, and the tech and stuff like that. I will say I got some angry messages from Nembom <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. he keeps saying that I represented the fletching table thing as too complicated. It's not <laughs> that complicated. It's fine. <laughs> People can do it. So yeah, so maybe it's not as complicated as I thought. Well, Just we've saying. had we've had Nembon on the show before. If we have the opportunity to have him back at any point, we will ask him what he meant by that and see if yep. we can get him to unpack the simplicity of the fletching table <laughs> in that update, which if people haven't seen it, uh, I think a few of us have edited it down and there were plenty of other people covering the April Fool's update, but you can find it in a video that I uploaded, which was the the highlights from our two and a half or so hour stream, where the GUI expands to include all <laughs> of the text from the header of the, the fletching table because it was designed to turn... Uh, to basically refine toxic resin that you would occasionally find as an ore block into Mm. other types of toxic resin with slightly better impurities and eventually if you refined it through multiple stages you might get a chance at whatever the new villager currency in the the in the snapshot (laughs) was like emeralds had been completely replaced with this other thing that was only possible to get through the fletching table perfect balancing for villagers <laughs> yes with all of the with all of the discussion around villager balancing it did feel like the icing on that particular cake yeah mm. um but yeah i i had a great time just going through that stuff and you're right about i think the community's response to it has been uh why on earth don't we get this amount of features and i think you very eloquently summarized why that happens is because most of them are a giant mess there isn't the level of depth to any of them and so many of them are just absurdly game breaking to the extent where that stream more or less ended with us driving the central end island out into the ring of islands (laughs) across the void at you know (laughs) 10 blocks per second or something and crashing yep. into the other side and by by that point we'd taken all of the obsidian pillars with us the dragon's respawn sequence was completely broken you know you can't yep. imagine something like that truly existing it was it was game breaking in a way i've never really seen in a a, a quote-unquote vanilla snapshot yeah definitely i think there's a lot a lot of layers of uh, quality of, of um making this fit so many different play styles making this be a good thing for the game not for one snapshot you play once but for we have a saying that uh, we say in the company for 50 years or more right that is our vision for minecraft so uh making things that stay good and you keep wanting to play them again and again for the future is is a lot harder (laughs) than just doing something fun the, the poisonous potato bricks are not going to be in the game for 50 years or more. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Perhaps. I would imagine that these kind of April Fool's snapshots would kind of be parallel to what people might see from other developers like Game Jam nights or Game Jam events where exactly. they just make something, throw spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks. There's a limited time. So you're not necessarily trying to make something that will last 50 years. But I would imagine at some level without getting into specifics, ideas might come out of something like this, whether it's this snapshot, another April Fool snapshot from years past, or even just one-off jokes, uh, stuff like that. I I would imagine that having that kind of imaginary whiteboard to just yes and and do something fun Mm. could eventually lead you to inspiration for a more honed and developed feature down the line or it might not but i think the the potential is definitely there i definitely agree like i think first of all we've seen that stuff from april fools did get into the game eventually in in previous stuff it's previous updates it's not (laughs) there is no chance something like a huge dimension will come in right that that's not that level stuff that is is more inspiration coming from it <clears throat> that happened i think uh, the early one i can remember is like uh, colored glass i think was in uh, april fools or something like that right uh so it definitely is possible but more than that even putting april fools to the side for a second prototyping is something we do constantly and we have something called prototyping friday which means every week you have half a day that you can do any sort of prototyping you want Right, it doesn't have to be part of the current update. It can be anything you want to talk to the team about and sort of inspire. So we basically do 
almost every week or whenever you're inspired, we do April Fools to ourselves internally and talk about ideas. The the mace <laughs> actually came out of one such prototype, right? And I think wow. that it's it's really interesting to see that that sort of um, fast development prototyping thing, it's not something we keep for April Fools. I prototyped a working version of the mace w- with quite a lot of the features in an afternoon. And yet it's taken us over two months now, or maybe even three months to get it in players' hands. And we're not done, right? There's still a lot of bug fixes we're doing right now. There's there's some tweaks that are going on. So it's, I think, yeah, I, I think it's important for people to know that this is not like, I don't know, we're not <laughs> keeping some nitro fuel away and only for April Fools, right? Like, we do this all the time. It's just getting it to some weird buggy working version of the game is really fast. Making it actually work in a way that you want it to work, that you uh, expect the things to be in the game, that that takes a long time. One of the people I always love following whenever April Fools comes around specifically is Xylafian because he will point out things in Twitter threads that I never thought were possible and in terms of like stuff where the game just completely broke and he said in a, in a thread that I posted about you know it's it's clear that a lot of these features aren't necessarily th- features that anybody wanted to commit to long term he said some of the stuff that he put in it initially completely broke item stacking to where it, once you had hovered over an item with your mouse it would no longer stack with other items and nobody noticed that because none of their features had anything to do with item stacking and he only noticed it the following day when he checked the code again so like uh-huh. the, the 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 ability to just completely break something that seems so fundamentally locked in from a player perspective and realizing that yeah it it is that fragile on the back end because of the wacky stuff that you can do when you're prototyping brand new exactly. things like that is is kind of a an eye-opening experience for somebody who's just been playing this game and has never really touched the coding side of it i i can give an example to how broken something is uh, i think the mace has less of these examples but i when i first prototyped archaeology around what, like two years before it was released right like uh, around very very first prototyping I prototyped a thing where <clears throat> you're brushing and an item is sort of uh, floating or hidden inside the block, right? Similar to what we have today, but um, the items didn't used to float out of the block. They sort of were hidden in the block, like we saw in the original trailers. The Minecraft Live presentation where exactly. it was kind of, yeah, a diamond block was in there and you were removing layers from the block instead of the item slowly emerging, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So my original prototype for this used in uh, invisible unbreakable item frames floating inside blocks that had code running every tick to check if they are revealed if the block around them is like revealed to the right layer and then popping the item right like that is the level of prototype like that is the worst kind of idea you could think of <laughs> of how to just make it look like it's working and if i showed you the video i have that video if i showed it to you it looks very similar to how it looks in the game but it's not it doesn't work as like yeah you would not want all the archaeology thing is the world to keep ticking right constantly yeah. it's, it's the or, kind of thing where if you had four players doing it at once then you'd almost crash your server or something exactly, like, exactly. <laughs> right? so yeah it is it is really eye-opening to hear about some of that stuff and the ways that you just you, you put together something that you're like this is how i want to do it but on the code side it needs to be so much more refined and elegant to make it in as yeah. a finished feature yeah yeah, I think the flotator, I haven't looked at the code, but I'm sure the flotator is also missing a bunch. Like, we all know how weird pistons are, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. to the pistons can delete bedrock. That That's how complicated and weird the code behind it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the flotator is, must be, like, really, really not great code behind. I haven't looked, but yeah. Uh, the, uh, what is it? Everyone talks about the grappling hook. I think the way it's implemented is really not... Even gameplay-wise, there is so much gameplay tuning I would do to it before it's even close to feeling game-ready. Features are fun, and I think that's exactly what we have this for, right? We get the community excitement, we get knowledge from this for quite small investment, right? Again, that's also important to say. I saw... 
was it uh, King Bay Dogs? So I don't. Someone said it on Twitter that for some reason people think that our actual updates take a month to develop, but that this update we probably spent a year developing. It's like people are like, why are you spending so much time on April Fools? Where it's exactly the opposite, right? We spent a few weeks on April Fools on off times when people are just having fun. Um, so it's not like we're diver- they're diverting a lot of resources to it. When you get fun items like that that happen in Minecraft, fun features where they're not coded very well at all, but they still have some just joshy fun appeal. Has there ever been any internal eurekas where maybe the game feature isn't all that cool, but the way that someone implemented from a technology side was just like, oh, wow, wait a minute. Like, we don't need the the potato ficator, but but how you coded the potato ficator, maybe we can use that in the game. Has there been any kind of like under the hood developments from these uh, development Fridays? So I would be less exposed to those things, right? Because I'm more of the design side. I, I do right. programming, but it's not as the really engine performance heavy stuff. I think from from the outside, what I could say is I remember the April Fools where we did the custom dimensions, right? And those followed in an update afterwards in the real game. So that that might have been a breakthrough, right? Like a code wise, maybe they figure out they tried it out in April Fools and then they refined the tech behind it afterwards. Yeah, that that's that's the example that I've been giving when people talk about like you know whether or not April Fool's features are worth working on, whether they're worth the time investment. And yeah, for a start, like you said, it doesn't take as long as people think it does to create this kind of prototype iteration of a feature. But also, yeah, it, it can lead to stuff like custom dimensions being possible and a a road test for that, even if it's not necessarily the reason that that stuff appears. I think mm. the Poisonous Potato update also had some really interesting ways of using the item component system that's just been implemented in recent snapshots. Yeah. Like like the fact that there were some potatoes that if you ate them, they turned into venomous potatoes that were like snakes. <laughs> and, yeah. and they looked no different from the regular potatoes, except they just didn't stack up the same way. And so there's there's like neat little things like that that I, I get the sense people are interested in you know whatever kind of side components they could add to this item that would change it and it it can get you used to programming in that system if it's something that's been worked on internally for a while but this isn't really the the first like public facing test of it yeah I, i think something that made me think while we were playing with it is the blocks that attack you because that's not really a thing right we don't have any blocks that detect players around them and attack them i'm guessing it's probably related to the um um cherry wood uh, leaves they sort of detect players around them and add particles so maybe it's really i i don't know but that that's like that's new technology that that happened in my head sort of thing that's interesting what what can we do in the game with this what kind of block can we do that react somehow to players around it in an interesting way it reminds me of that uh you you're gonna remember the name of this johnny but the the chest monster in dungeons and dragons it looks like a treasure chest Mimic. but it has oh, a mouth. mimics yeah yeah Mimic, yeah <laughs> <laughs> that would i'm not sure if that would be good or bad in minecraft but it would it would suit i think the vibe like a block that would track and attack mm-hmm. you would be i mean that's as long as it doesn't blow up because that would be just creeper level of disappointment but uh that would be I think on par would feel very Minecrafty for the lack of a better way to describe it. Like I would not, that wouldn't be shocking or surprising if that ever made it into a game. I think the uh, Minecraft equivalent of a mimic is the trap chest. It's something that, you know, gives players mm. a little bit of agency over setting mm-hmm. the trap themselves, but is is very much in the game for people who want it. Yeah. So I'll say two things about this. One thing is the the mimic equivalent of Minecraft is the shulker. And actually, originally, <laughs> yes. they were meant to be a lot more like blocks. I think they were really trying to make them look like the purple blocks, basically. Oh. Um, and and I talked to Jens about it, and he's like, yeah, I had some ideas and stuff like that. They didn't happen, you know, like everything else. Like, other things were more interesting, or maybe it didn't feel as good as the idea. But that was the original idea. That's why they're square. That's why they're stuck into other blocks and stuff like that. That's why they close, so you think they're not attacking until they attack. Um, so that's really cool. Also, I would say, I don't know if it's surprising or not, but that idea has come up internally at least dozens of times. <laughs> and I, I got so many DMs with this idea. Like, I think so many... The Mimic is such a good, iconic monsters in, in D&D 
that I think so many people are like thinking about it. And I think the concept is really good, right? There's a reason why it's cool. It's really surprising. It's really fun. I, I, I think we generally don't like adding things that are too uh, tropey. Like, that's why we don't, like, for example, in Caves and Cliffs, so many people were like, add the Yeti. And we're like, we're not adding a Yeti. We're not adding goblins. We're not adding it, it, the, the Minecraft lore is its own lore, right? Like uh, pretty much the only exceptions to it are the really old ones. Like zombies are classic, right? Uh, skeletons are classic. Slimes, uh, dragon. yeah, totally. Um, but, but even they, we constantly remind ourselves internally that they shouldn't follow normal rules. These are Minecraft zombies and, <clears throat> and they should right. behave as Minecraft zombies. And sometimes that creates deviation from the normal like myth of zombies um so yeah so we try not to i think it doesn't mean we'll never do a mimic i think we will never call it a mimic and we will try to put the minecraft spin on it at least right but i think in general we like coming up like i think the breeze was so fun it's the first really weird quirky mob we've added in a while i think yeah, I've I've been trying out trial chambers every so often, like most recently when the ominous trials were added and I was working my way through those, and the breeze is still one that I have yet to kind of find a rhythm with, and that's mm. exciting to me, if anything, because it means like there are new challenges waiting for me and I can start to like do that minecraft thing where you optimize the way you encounter something like you know how to handle creepers at this point by like hitting them and then yeah. backing away and like shooting them from range like each little encounter because it becomes its own tiny battle and breezes are one that i've i've tried rushing them down a couple of times but then they'll leap over me or they'll try and keep me at range and i can't hit them with projectiles because they deflect and yeah. so there's there's so many little kind of quirky ways that it can mess up your rhythm that it, it it's really interesting new challenge to try and take them on so i'm looking forward to doing a bit more testing there's so many little things like that to teach right because teaching about yeah creeper blows up is one thing but teaching about this is how you deal with it you run to it so you get like a knockback uh, attack when you hit it mm -hmm. flies back so you run back stuff like that and it really made me think of how clever each first mob was when it's added. Zombie is just a classic. Skeleton is okay, now you have range to deal with. A creeper is, you need to deal with it completely differently and it's like stealthy. Spiders can climb up. Like it feels like really every new one that added, added a whole new, like you say, puzzle sort of to deal with. And I'm really curious about now thinking what kind of mobs we can do that are really simple, but just really change how you play or how you fight them. Yes, well, uh, I, that means potato zombies aren't going to be making their way into the, the main <laughs> game anytime soon, but uh, yeah, who knows. Um, uh, I, speaking of that, I'm trying to resist the temptation to dip back into the poisonous potato update. I have far too much digging to do on Minecraft SOS that I can really justify putting the time into it, but the call mm. of the fletching table is is strong at this point, so we'll we'll see. Um, in the meantime, I can share a few screenshots with the folks in our show notes this week, but uh, my dig on Minecraft SOS is probably about past the halfway mark. There is now a wide enough area for me to like clear out that I rode a strider through it for an advancement this week, <laughs> where you bring the strider to the overworld and ride it through a, a lava lake. I couldn't find any large enough lava lakes naturally underground, so I created my own effectively mm. like strider drag racing strip down the center <laughs> of this massive dig that I've been been working on. So yeah, I'm 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 fully committed to digging this whole thing out as like as as expediently as I can at this point, and I'm gonna try and get a few uh, a few friends involved in that soon to get it dig out slightly faster so i can move on to the next stage which is rebuilding all of the terrain in the sky but uh it's it's been a fun project so far and i'm enjoying finding little quirky uses for it like this yeah i've, I've been seeing pictures on twitter that's your um chunk error simulator yeah. <laughs> yes build a, a few people have uh turned up at my base and gone this just looks wrong like this looks like you've you've deleted <laughs> parts of the world here and i say yes i have it just takes me five hours to do each of them <laughs> I think it's really fun to do it that way. Like usually people do it either layer by layer or in the circles. I think doing it chunk by chunk is kind of cool. Yeah. Are you keeping track at all of statistics? Like how many of each blocks you found it in chunk or stuff like that? Uh, I haven't, but a couple of other people who've helped me out have. I think uh, LD Shadow Lady came came by and did a chunk and she like 
kind of recapped all of the ores and stuff that she found in in one of her videos i have been keeping track of overall statistics in terms of amount of stone mined because i'm fairly certain i've done a minimal enough amount of that elsewhere that the broader figure of i've done i think over six hundred thousand stone mined using a diamond pickaxe at this point um and now i'm obviously including moss in that because working chunk by chunk i get down to the deep slate layer and i switch to moss so i can instantly mine it with a hoe and uh, mm. that has now gone past the quarter of a million blocks mark uh, with just moss. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's taking a while. I think my chat figured out that the the interior of this, uh, because it's a 128 block diameter circle, and so you can calculate the area of that pretty easily. With the depth of the world in the area I started, it turns out to be about 2 million blocks total. Um, and I'm only going to use about 60,000 of those to rebuild it in the sky because it's going to be hollow. But I, I like the the notion that I will have completed a two, a, a two million block project provided that I don't die on this uh, hardcore server. Very, very cool. There's something really satisfying about removing chunks of the world in Minecraft. I know it's destructive. Like I know it's, it's I think it's part of it is like, you know, if you go into the backyard as a kid and you start digging a hole your parents are gonna get mad and <laughs> unless it's like a sandbox like you you're only allowed to do it in very specific places and even then you're not supposed to go down like super deep you know uh and i feel like when you have something like this there's just something really fun about just i'm just gonna make a giant hole i'm just gonna ruin this there's a higher purpose obviously with your project picks but i, I just i like that initial stage of like first we make a mess <laughs> and then then yeah. we do something nice with it yeah, it's, it's definitely that. I don't know if anybody's uh, parents would allow them to dig a hole 128 meters wide either. <laughs> I feel like at that point, you're, you're, you're going to have to employ a, a JCB or something <laughs> to start digging the whole thing out. Um, but that's, that's my week, at least. Uh, what's new with you, Joel? Well, I don't have to ask the Homeowners Association in West Hill whether or not I can make changes. So that means that I have been able to do a bunch of little tweaks throughout uh, the West Hill Valley. I started off real simple. I realized that there was a barn that had no interior. It was over by the wheat mill. So I just filled it up with like stacks of hay and a little timber loft and just you know chests and crates and things to make it look like it was filled up really enjoying using blocks like bamboo and wrapping them in signs and making it look like or like wet hay or fresh hay that hasn't yet dried and turned yellow you can do little things like that which is really fun and uh returning to some of these places that were built two and a half three years ago before we had the bamboo blocks before we had uh tough and a couple of other things it's been fun to kind of go in and retexture some things i really like using the mangrove wood block with the bark in pathing and in the floors of some barns it has that kind of old rotted wood plank look something that's been scuffed up by years of boots and people walking across it so that's been fun to to mess with and then I turned my focus over to the crossroads just outside of West Hill. This is the north road that crosses with an east-west road. And it needed things like signs to point you towards West Hill. And uh, also to build on what we were talking about last week on the show, uh, Johnny had mentioned the appeal to a bunch of different paths throughout the West Hill Valley, not just the main roads. And I thought I should really take that and run with it. And I mean, it happens all the time in the city where I live, where there'll be a sidewalk that'll go at a 90 degree turn. And then there's a patch of grass for whatever reason. And there's also a dirt trail where people are like, I'm not walking up to the corner. I'm going 45 across this way. And you can see where people have been spending years walking across the green. And so I thought, well, wagons would take the the paved road but in this medieval town if you're on foot you're taking the shortest route so i started adding footpaths that either cut the corners of the crossroads or connected uh two parts of the roads that got you closer to the inn that kind of thing and after that was done and all textured i was left with much smaller green spaces to then fill in with whether it was a bush or a couple of bits of grass maybe a lantern to keep things lit at night Uh, I had like a little tree with a sign on it for a farm. And the other thing that I decided to try and do was adding some features that wouldn't necessarily block the view of the town, the crossroads, where you needed to go. So I started doing these custom mossy rock kind of outcrops that don't stick much more than a slab outside of the ground, even if they get that high. Usually the highest thing is a moss carpet. 
but it does a really good job if I, you know, if you don't mind me tooting my own horn of creating some texture that makes you think I shouldn't walk across that. Like that looks like it's in my way. And so it sort of pushes mm. the player to be like, well, it's either the dirt path or the road. It doesn't really feel like it would be worth my time to walk over this thistly looking rough patch of stone. It looks kind of unpleasant to walk across, but it looks pleasant to walk by and it creates some detail without just being more bushes and more grass, uh, you know, as, as you tend to get into because the whole area is a sunflower plain. So I really have my pick of whatever bushes and, and different blocks I want to use because they all tend to go very well in, in the plains biome. So it was just a fairly straightforward, but time consuming week of doing these kind of things. But I'm really feeling like the crossroads is feeling more lived in. It has more history. It feels like slowly, but surely West Hill is feeling more like it's been part of the environment for longer than, <laughs> than, than just the day and a half, you know, <laughs> in terms of having like a flat plains out front of the wall, we're slowly building things up. I love the signpost. I think that's a really cool feature. And yeah. Thank obviously you. hanging signs were meant for this to begin with, but I've always felt like I when I want to put a hanging sign up, I take the shortest possible route to just getting something that looks functionally kind of like a signpost. So it'll just be like a series of fences, one overhanging and a hanging sign coming down from that. But what you've got is a a stone structure, you've got some slabs and trap doors to kind of give it the sense that it's pointing in a specific direction. The signs are obviously hanging from there, and then the lantern next to all of the other items that also use chains to hang them from. I think that's a really nice kind of like space filler in there where you don't need two signs on that side because naturally that's the 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 thing pointing towards the really obvious massive town. Um, but you've got a, a lantern there to provide light as well. I think that's a, a really nice um, kind of concise build, yeah, but it does a lot with a, a minimal amount of blocks. Thanks. Yeah, it uh, it went through a couple of iterations live on stream. Uh, it did move. It was closer to West Hill, but I decided it would be better to have it when you first arrive at the crossroads on the north side as opposed to the south side. And it, it felt like more of its own thing when it wasn't directly next to the main gate. Because it, it, then the, the sign to West Hill kind of felt redundant because you're like, you're under the gate at that point. <laughs> you know, you, like you kind of know where you are. Um, but but for anybody watching uh, later on our show notes and checking out the screenshots, I will point out that we do have the uh, Wandering Trades data pack, which gives me mini blocks. So that's an, a smooth andesite mini block. Yeah, I was wondering if that's the debug stick or something. No, like that. no, just a couple of data packs. <laughs> uh, the other one is the armor statues data pack. So I gave an arrow to an armor stand and then floated that up into the sign. And so instead of having to do text arrows on the sign, there's actually like a Minecraft arrow item kind of floating there. And I do plan to do that for the other signs. But one of the things I try to do when I'm not entirely sure about how something is going to look is that I'll throw it up and I'll write the signs in quickly and I'll do a couple of details, proof of concept, and then I'll leave it there for a little bit to say like, okay, is this bugging me? Do I need to move it? And so I'm pretty happy with it. So I think now I'll go in and I'll add arrows to other signs that need it or have room for it. Uh, I might put a different symbol on the sign for the West Hill River Inn, like maybe I'll put a fish or something on it, or uh, I don't know, a bush, anything to kind of differentiate it from the other signs a little bit. Uh, I've had some luck with that in the past. We have a, an apothecary in the town and I used a potion and kind of floated a potion on a hanging sign with the armor statue set pack. And that was really fun and effective to do. So, so that's the plan. Um, but uh, I appreciate that. It's uh, it was a lot of fun to work on that kind of stuff. I did have the advantage of having some street lights that were already designed. So I kind of took that as a basis and kind of like springboarded from there. But uh, I, I, I do feel like hanging signs really give you a lot of opportunities to do different things the, the the challenge of course is that they have a much lower character count than a full sign yeah but then you can write stuff on the front and back of them now as well so you could have a sign on the way into west hill that says welcome to west hill population you know 1200 and then <laughs> one on the way out that says you know thank you for driving carefully or something you know? like you could, <laughs> yeah you could just do do some uh, some fun stuff with hanging signs and i think that's the great thing we have them on um on the minecraft sos server as well uh, just pointing to people's bases from spawn and it's so great that you can have differing text on opposite sides so you can point your way back to something yeah. or have the arrow go two separate ways when actually it's still pointing towards the same landmark it just has to go left to right instead of right to left on the opposite side it's they're great I, i'm really happy with the way hanging signs turned out i'm wondering it, it, this is a survival project right correct yeah 
Yeah. I'm wondering how it's felt lighting up a city build like this since the lighting changes. Do you feel any difference? Oh, it's much, much easier and much more atmospheric. Uh, I really enjoy being able to use something like a soul lantern in place of a full lantern or multiple lanterns to get just enough light that it's not going to spawn, but still dim. There's an area of the town that's part of a taiga biome. And so a lot of the lanterns outside of the houses over there are are the blue ones because it, it goes so much better in the taiga biome. And it mm. means that I can light up less or light up more with intention than out of functionality and out of worry of of getting some some creeper surprises we still have some places that are that are not spawn proof roofs are pretty dangerous <laughs> uh i've had a creeper mm. drop off of the of the wall several times uh to the south of the town there's a dark spot where they just they can spawn on the wall um but uh for the most part i've been able to either light something or use some different I ideas like texturing with a trap door on a wall will also kind of create a, an unspawnable space in the block space that the trapdoor is in so if you get a dark spot sometimes mm. the solution isn't light sometimes it's like add details <laughs> specifically things that block mm. spawns and so that's been that's been fun but i do remember it was um it was really challenging i feel like probably because of doing the spawn chunks i knew the lighting update was coming when it came time to do some bigger lighting jobs around the town so i was kind of waiting i was kind of spamming torches and going like look this mm. is temporary until i know when this lighting update happens, then I'll be able to go through and properly light it. It's still challenging specifically in the roads. So when you get outside the town, there's just going to be dark spots. Like I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to light a full section of road without it feeling like a city, you know, like I, I want it to feel like a country road, not like it's got right. street lamps every, you know, 15 or, or, or so blocks. And it's right now, um, there are dark spots. I'm trying to keep the dark spots off the road, but that still means that in the fields, specifically the farmer fields that are farther outside the town, there's definitely spots for people or people, <laughs> zombify people mm -hmm. and other, and other nefarious <laughs> friends can, can spawn. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been interesting. I really, I like, I mean, I like the lighting changes for sure. When you've shared uh, mm. screenshots of the interiors as well, it's so nice being able to see like one or two candles here and there, and that provides enough interior light to yeah. decorate like a small space instead of it having to be clumps of four candles everywhere just for the functionality. And the candle is there mm. because it, it vibes with the medieval stuff a lot better, but you're you're still kind of wishing for uh, a little bit of extra light in those darker spaces. But yeah, but having having zero light spawns means that you can stick one candle in there and it still does something, which is kind of crucial, I think. I've done that in creepy passages under the roads, sewers, little military passages where you want it to be dark and moody. So you're okay with the lighting level being one or two. And sometimes just like one or two candles in a little nook in the wall will be just enough to light it up and have it be mm. spawn proof. And so that that's really great because usually the, the places have staircases and of course stairs are not spawnable. So the staircases can be dark. The hallway just has to be light enough so that you can see where you're going and have nothing spawn down there and surprise you. And it, it does. those That candle trick keeps it really, really creepy looking. Moving on into the news for the week, Hardcore Mode is now available for testing in Bedrock Edition. The article, linked in our show notes, officially announces Hardcore Mode, which was first made available in Minecraft Bedrock Edition Preview 1.21.0.20. That also adds ominous events. This beta preview release introduces ominous events, which we covered in last week's Java edition snapshot. Ominous trials can now be attempted by exploring a trial chamber with the active bad omen status effect. Bad omen is now acquired by drinking the ominous bottle instead of killing a pillager patrol captain. This preview also includes changes to trial chambers and the heavy core, the new oozing, weaving, and infested potion effects, and tweaks to a few other upcoming features. Please note, there are some changes that are already in the Java Edition snapshot that have not made it here, but we are working on more tweaks that will be included in the upcoming previews. That's a quote from the article. Hardcore mode is toggled and can be found in the Create New World screen. Quote, gameplay for this feature is still in development, so expect a few issues when it's in preview. Added the hardcore mode in-game HUD UI. Hardcore mode worlds can now be updated to realms. 
out of game menu screens currently do not display when a hardcore mode world is loaded on a realm. Minecraft Java Edition got snapshots 24w14a this week. We all have a link to the Minecraft.net changelog in our show notes as always. This one's mainly technical changes. The data pack version is now 38, which includes a couple of small tweaks, including support for spawning player heads using a UUID instead of specifying a player name. The game now requires Java 21 and now requires a 64-bit operating system. The included Java distribution is now the Microsoft build of OpenJDK 21.0. 0.2. There are a few fixed bugs, of course, at this stage. Um, notably, the power tag for Wither Skulls, small slash dragon fireballs, and wind charges are not synced correctly, leading to stuttering during flight. That's now been fixed, along with wind charge stuttering when flying through the air. There was previously a bug where snowballs, eggs, experience bottles, and ender pearls were destroyed instead of being deflected when hitting the breeze. Also, hitting the breeze with a player reflected or dispensed wind charge caused it to become trapped within the breeze until the breeze moved. Those have been fixed along with a bunch of other bug fixes. Those and along with the data pack changes can be found in the minecraft.net changelog linked in our show notes. So I think the major headline here is hardcore mode finally arriving in Bedrock Edition, which I'm sure has been a mammoth effort by the Bedrock team, but of course the uh, the hardcore players out there will be very happy that it's accessible to Bedrock players from this preview onwards. This is something that might actually get me to play a little bit more on Bedrock, uh, similar to something Ulraf mentioned earlier with you know the the time available and wanting to spend time in certain games. And I think even you picks were talking about it in terms of spending more time in the in the potato <laughs> snapshot versus yeah. the work that you have to do in SOS. I feel very torn between trying new things like being in the mood for Skyblock or wanting to try a hardcore world when it's really popular on YouTube, thinking like it just takes time away from West Hill and what I'm trying to finish up. Uh, but very often I'll be on the Xbox thinking like, you know, maybe I'll boot up Minecraft and learn a little bit about uh, Bedrock Edition. Uh, although I think I would have very similar experiences on that than I than uh, Ulraf would on mobile because like I I can see myself being pretty good with a mouse and keyboard on the PC for Java, but then switching to a controller for Minecraft, like I've only ever tried it once mm. and it was slow and any fight Sorry. was hairy <laughs> it was not not an overwhelming success well i survived but i wouldn't necessarily be bragging about the experience um so a hardcore world would definitely be a challenge i'd have to be really careful about what i'd be doing <laughs> with a controller on xbox yeah but the appeal to a hardcore world for me is that it's finite at some point you're it's going to be over it's not going to be another long-term project that would pull me away from what i'm doing and also, I wouldn't have <laughs> quite the bravery that you do, Pixel Revs, in that if I did start a hardcore world on Bedrock, I don't think I'd be trying to do big projects. Uh, much like you, Alraf, I think I'd be focusing on small things, learning early game mechanics again, focusing on small things. That way, if something did happen and I lost it, it's like, well, it was an experience. It wasn't necessarily something I wanted to keep around, you know? Yeah, Ulraf, in your uh, long experience with this game, have you been much of a hardcore player? Have you really dipped into that? Or is it something that you you prefer to keep a world around and not have it cruelly snatched mm. from you by a creeper or a zombie? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle because I think there is such a big appeal that hardcore brings back the danger of death and it sort of makes everything feel more meaningful. And I think... There's almost no other thing that makes me quit a world from the feeling of, well, there's no point to anything anymore, right? Like, if I just ran 50 times to beat the dragon, like, keep dying and running, keep dying and running, it makes you feel like, basically how we fought the mega spud or how it was called in the yeah the the the, the, bo the big potato boss that was yeah. in the uh, the april fool snapshot it makes you feel like it's not really an achievement at the end when you beat it that way I, I felt at least so i think it's really nice that hardcore makes everything feel more meaningful yeah but at the same time the idea of all my memories being snatched away like years of playing on something I, I don't know. I think I think something also that is interesting around this is that I think this is a bit skewed by content creators in the sense that I think it I totally see the appeal of doing this on YouTube. When I did the uh, Twitch, I, I stopped streaming a bit recently. I, I should get back. But when I did that a lot, I played only hardcore almost exclusively. And I think as a content creator, because everything can be deleted tomorrow 
and everything being deleted is actually not bad. It means I can start building the same farms again with a twist. A lot of like new viewers can come in because they don't have that much like old things they're not part of, right? Like I think there's a lot of an appeal as a content creator to create a new world. So hardcore sort of go into it, I think, really well. For me as a personal player, there's such an appeal of I've been playing this world for a year or more and I just fell down. <laughs> like I, I might I, I did the unspeakable, I mined straight down and I fell. Is this really how I want my two years of this world to yeah. end? Sort of thing, right? Like it's Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I haven't been playing uh hardcore. What I have been doing is I've been playing a world personally on Java. Uh, that's like my comfort world. I play it when I want to relax a bit. And that is hardcore in concept, but what I'm aiming to do, I haven't died yet, so I, I don't know if I will keep to it, but my plan is that if I die, I run a command that teleports me randomly to 10,000 blocks away. Oh. And I don't open F3 in this world, so I literally don't know where I went or how to get back. So I'm st practically starting a new world, but there is a chance that randomly I will run across something I found before, right? And sort of, I'll be able to go back to my old base and sort of, it's almost like an archaeological site, right? Like maybe years in the future, I'll run across my old base and it's like, oh, I built all these things, isn't it cool? Sort of. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, now that's that's a really fun uh, concept for it, and something that I'd considered doing in previous uh, survival guide worlds, in like a long term worlds where terrain would update or something, and I think, well, I could just continue the same world and move myself somewhere else, but then I don't get the thrill of going to fight the dragon for the first time and that whole search being yeah. different. And so I think it's it's really cool if it's a world that you plan to keep long term just for kind of personal gameplay. And I agree that like content creators tend to skew the 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 hardcore game a little bit just because i think it's a perfect format for twitch streaming it's something why I, I started a hardcore series on youtube a while ago but i thought if i'm not documenting every minute of gameplay then i could die off camera just because i happen to not be recording during like a long grind for resources or something and mm. then i have no evidence of the fact that i died so i would just have to log in and say well that's it i guess and it feels like an anticlimax at that point i think if you're streaming on twitch and everything feels continuous you never log into that world unless you are live on twitch it makes a lot more sense and i think it's a a really fun format but i'm curious to see what impact hardcore coming to bedrock edition has on the broader community of players how many more stories we start to hear from bedrock edition players losing their worlds in hardcore circumstances or you know any of the the stuff that people get up to where previously it's been only occupied by java edition players who we know are a relatively small fraction of the overall copies of minecraft that have been sold and obviously everyone has access to both bedrock and java if you're like on game pass or anything like that so you can kind of go back and forth between the two but i think uh, hardcore being on consoles being on mobile that's going to be a very new and interesting experience for people i have the reservation having spent so much time at endgame on the citadel of just dying in hardcore, jumping off of something, forgetting I don't have feather falling or forgetting I don't have netherite boots or no elytra on. And just like, you know, you jump, double tap space bar and go, wait a minute, <laughs> I don't have one of those. Mm -hmm. Just out of pure muscle memory, right? I'd have to really retrain my brain if I was to build anything high. I feel like a lot of my builds in hardcore would be like inside caves or like on the ground, like four blocks max. <laughs> Boxes. <laughs> you're, you're like, I'm spreading out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going not gonna to attempt yeah. anything too high up for a while. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> I do like that teleport idea, though, Elraf. It sort of reminds me of of sci-fi or or like No Man's Sky, where like you're you're sort of in some sort of time loop where you are. There's a person ahead of you leaving you stuff potentially <laughs> and you don't know wow. whether it's you or somebody else or like are you the past you or are you the future you like what how does that all work and uh adding a command just to teleport you know ten thousand blocks is is great because it it removes that temptation because like if, if it was end game and you had elytra and and the nether you'd think well i can probably get back there if i knew where it was but if you're starting over again and you got nothing ten thousand blocks at day mm. one is like that's something i don't want to do <laughs> so we're starting exactly. over again <laughs> 
Right, we should move on into uh, listener emails for this week uh, since we've uh, got a, a, a chunky main discussion that we want to get to. But in the meantime, if you'd like to email the show, the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. And we want to remind everybody, if you haven't listened to our recent episodes, that episode 300 is fast approaching and we're planning an all Q&A episode to celebrate. To try and include as many members of the community as possible, we'd like people to send in a one-sentence question about anything you would like to ask us. This isn't just limited to Minecraft, it can be about the podcast, other video games we've enjoyed, our own artistic inspirations for building in Minecraft and elsewhere, other experiences in our lives and whatnot. We consider it kind of a way of getting to know me and Joel a little bit as well, like our patrons have been able to do. Um, You can keep them fun, of course, but one-sentence questions can be sent to spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Make sure you add 300 Q&A to the subject line of your email so that we can easily see which ones are meant to be part of the show. Um, but first off, we have a an email from Resimba, uh, which is kind of addressed to all of us at this point, um, with the subject being influencing baby villagers. Hey, Johnny, Joel, and Ulraf. I was listening to episode 290, the super flat chat with Mog Swamp, and the topic of biome-specific villagers came up. This feature was mentioned as problematic for players limited to a single biome. I think it would be interesting if baby villagers checked their surrounding blocks to decide their villager type. For example, the presence of jungle logs or leaves could turn a baby villager into a jungle villager even in a plains biome. Without these blocks around, the biome would be the default for determining villager type. In regular worlds, the fastest way to find these blocks would still probably be searching for a jungle, but since the wandering trader sells saplings, super flat players would also be able to gain access to those rarer trades. Curious for your thoughts. The wandering trader was killed by Rusimba because it didn't have any jungle saplings. (laughs) I mean, I like the idea of influencing baby villagers as a specific point in the email. I think that, from what I can tell, once they're an adult, that opportunity would have passed. So players would have to move a baby villager to a specific location with specific blocks in order to influence their adult type. And saplings seem like the obvious influence block, maybe dead bushes or something for deserts. I can't remember whether dead bushes are a thing in super flat. I'm pretty sure mug swap said they weren't. So maybe some other block could be an influence. Um, I was thinking actually knowing that we had all on the show that decorated pots or archaeology or sherds could be used in that way, kind of like a cultural thing to influence the villagers, but they don't really reflect the biomes mm. in the same way that a sapling does. So I, I, I don't, and I don't know how this would be communicated to players in game, but I think it's an interesting idea to try and influence the, uh, I guess we'll call it the culture of a villager uh, at an early stage in their life to try and get the kind of trades that you want. I mean, Alraf, what do you think of, of um, Rasinbar's email? I think more specifically, I think there is an interesting question here about what really defines a biome as well, right? Like um, we've actually had discussions before internally about some, some quite old people in the company uh, were actually talking about maybe biomes should be more dynamic, more reliant on blocks versus the sort of static sort of uh, situation we have right now. What if I take, I don't know, a hundred stacks of sand and cover a forest? Is that now a desert sort of thing, right? And I think it's it was a really interesting philosophical question to think about how much should players be able to affect the world in survival? Like, I think I, I remember even someone saying that this is a personal opinion of one person in, in the company, that they were saying, um, isn't survival ultimate goal is actually to become creative, right? Right. Um, and I think it's a very interesting perspective. Uh, but I think I remember that on that time, and it's been years and I haven't thought about it recently, so it's, I wonder if my opinion changed a lot. But I think at that time, I was quite adamant that I think biomes being static is good. And I think it's tied to my opinion that I, I actually think uh, having multiple bases is quite an interesting thing in the game. So I'm always wary when we create stuff that uh, are stuff for, for example, for 
uh, skyblocks map, right? Or for, in this case, super flat, where we're trying to make everything accessible from the same spot, right? So many people have been uh, suggesting, for example, uh, renewable sand by crushing down cobblestone into sand, right? Or something like that. And I think that I generally am, again, where I, I, I'm trying not to say the word against, because I'm wary of it. It depends on the case where we're making it so you can make a machine anywhere that does everything, right? I kind of like, I am one of the people who were on the side of uh, piglins cannot survive in the overworld, right? We made them turn into zombified piglins, but someone was like, what if they are under a roof? What if we close them? What if we splash them with a potion? And I'm like, no, I, I like the fact that you can't have them in the overworld because what does that mean that means that if you want a piglin farm a bartering farm you have to make it in the nether and now you need interesting mechanics like how do i transfer items between these how do i make a safe passage for me into the nether into this farm like or, or if i'm if we're talking about will sand be renewable in the future right i i, I have been talking about things should still be like i like things like the geode Right, you can't move the geode around. You can't take the budding geode and put it in your base. I like that you need to do these connections between multiple bases. So this this is what came to mind immediately when we're thinking about this uh, with this email. I think it it's it's also possible to find a smaller version. Right, this could be affecting only baby villagers, and then it doesn't take away what I'm saying. I, I always, I gotta say, always when we're, like, we've had these discussions of super flat for quite a bit in the last few months, and I always feel like, to me, it seems like the answer to this is to have super flat with all biomes. Like, I think the challenge with super flat is not having a lot of the structures, it's having a very flat terrain, it's not having ores, right? So much of the gameplay experience is already altered. I've never felt like not having other biomes is core to this experience. And I feel like doing that will create an experience that's actually more enjoyable for those kind of players rather than trying, because this, like, this solution solves villages, but there is so many other things that break in super flat. I, I don't know. I feel like this is trying to solve a big, like a, a general problem with a very specific solution. So yeah, when we had Mog Swamp on the show, he was talking about not really enjoying the kind of patchwork feel of biomes when they were added artificially by players to a to a super flat world, um, with like world editors and that kind of thing. And I, mm. I think while yeah, I I can I can understand that, but maybe on a larger scale, like something the equivalent of like a large biomes world where you're not just going to have these splodges of terrain dotting the horizon all over the place, yes. but it still unlocks the ability to spawn certain types of mobs in different places, right? Like, exactly. you know, there are some things that are locked to specific biomes, like drowned can't spawn unless there's a river, an ocean, or a dripstone cave. So there's there's yep. certain things like that. And you can, I think you can farm drowned by uh, drowning zombies, right? But there's there's still like little little things like that that make the ability to get tridents and nautilus shells that way a little easier or or, or what have you um for mm. me for a super flat world this email brings the issue of what if i don't have jungle saplings you're kind of at the mercy of the wandering trader when you want to get started in the early stages of your your villager trading empire so that 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 mm. still feels kind of restrictive in a sense and going back to the even the the biome altering mechanics sort of remind me of this as well but whenever there's a mechanic that a villager has to detect its surroundings or something is responding to the blocks that are nearby it reminds me of terraria where the npcs will only move into a house if they can detect that there are certain requirements around them like uh, there's a minimum size for a house you have to have walls a table and chair and a back wall since it's a, a 2d side scrolling game and so there are things like mm. that that people have suggested for villagers in the past that make sense, but they sort of turn into the the raw mechanics that villagers used to have where they used to breed based on whether there were things inside or outside of a house and the doors yeah. were the kind of threshold of that. And so you had a door, a torch behind it on a block and one block of roof covering it and that was technically something a villager <laughs> would think of as a house. And there yeah. are so many ways of exploiting it to the stage where it doesn't really look like anything is happening. I like the idea of 
moving a villager into something that looks like a tropical cabin and then they come out wearing a jungle villager's outfit but how on earth does the game determine something that complex when deciding hey a villager should change their culture and 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 change the way they they dress in order to provide you different trades it's 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 an interesting kind of challenge i suppose game design wise but then also i suppose the problem then becomes how do you communicate that to new players right that's always a, a big challenge i think a lot of our features are like that i think just recently the mace that that sort of came up as well and i think how, how do you know that a smash attack is a thing how do you know that you need to fall to create this effect right i think uh, a lot of things in minecraft are sort of slowly accumulated knowledge and we're doing a lot of work recently um we've been doing a lot of work uh, on on looking at new players and trying to make that experience a bit more smooth uh, but i think ah, it's it's such a big challenge because you at the same time there is something about the slow discovery process of getting into this game of the excitement of learning things slowly and not by a ai generated voice in the game right like a tutorial it's, it's such such a complicated not issue. not learning things with a poisonous potato on your head telling you to go and find a village <laughs> <laughs> that was that exactly. was an, another aspect of the april fool snapshot that caught me by surprise was that there was effectively a story going on <laughs> um but yeah it's uh an, an interesting conundrum and it's cool that those kind of conversations are still happening even if uh yeah no, nobody's quite found the solution to them yet like the sorting hat from Harry Potter, but a potato. <laughs> yes, absolutely that. Yeah, it, it, the sorting hat, except with uh, funny like comedy glasses and a, a big nose and a mustache, <laughs> and, and you're you're most of the way there. Awesome. Next email comes from Ira the Cool Beacon Modifications. Hi, Pix Joel and Elraf. I was listening to episode two ninety one, ominous events, where you were discussing beacon effects. What if the new heavy core could be placed inside of a beacon, which could create a quote heavy beacon with different effects or maybe drop a light core item that could be kind of the inverse mace possibly bestowing the levitation effect on victims ira the cool was mm -hmm. killed by an ominous bogged wearing trimmed netherite armor that sounds like a complicated death line like that's as the <laughs> as the mobs get more and more complex the death lines get longer and longer <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've not seen any wearing netherite armor, but once you start one of those ominous trials, there are definitely some that spawn in with diamond, and that was a surprise. <laughs> that was was really mm. cool to see. Yeah, like copper trimmed diamond wearing uh, skeletons firing at me was uh, yeah definitely a fun part of the experience. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Ulraf, you're obviously here to talk about the mace, and we're going to get onto a bit more of that in a second. But obviously, the the heavy core is a subject of much mystery. I think that the name mm. of the heavy core feels very deliberate to me. The core of what? Um, but do you think it could be a core of a beacon? How do you feel about that idea? <laughs> uh, so that's that's really interesting. And I think I, I really loved seeing all the discussions about what the core of what exactly, or what is this item? What, what sort of role did it play in this structure that you find it? And how is it related to whoever built these structures? And I think that's all really intentional. I think um, we, I could have easily, we could have easily chosen a much simpler name like uh, Macehead or something like that, right? And I think that we intentionally chose something that can have a lot more uh, interesting ideas and it can be expanded in the future and can deepen the lore and mystery around these places. Uh, and then we might have some ideas of our own about what it actually means or the core of what, but I think it's much more interesting to see uh, the players talking about, like, this is a very interesting idea that I haven't really thought about. I think the beacon in general is something that I've been excited about expanding ever since I, I joined Mojang. Like, I think there's so many interesting things we can do with it. Um, the core is a great idea, but even, like, stuff I thought about was, like... Um, the the layers of the beacon sort of affecting more things than just unlocks for example or the 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 price of activating it doesn't really change what it's doing like there's so many opportunities here of creating cool new things with the beacon um heavy core being sort of i think i think something that i would just intuitively i have not thought this through <laughs> so it might be a really silly idea but i think intuitively what i would do if anything is I would put the heavy core above the beacon 
And that creates like a weird new beacon beam effect that you can't get normally. And that's like signifying you just activated something here. What, what would that be? It almost makes me think like, can this create an ominous event, a new ominous event, right? You, you created an evil beacon that now you need <laughs> yeah. to defeat. So, something that happens in the radius of the beacon. Or like in Minecraft Legends, they played around with beacons a little bit. And I think they did the same thing in Minecraft Dungeons, turning it into like a beam weapon. But um, yeah. Minecraft Legends had piglins taking beacons and corrupting them with their own sort of nether magic, and then that would darken the sky in the overworld, and that was how you knew that the piglins were on the attack and were trying to spread the nether to the overworld. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yes. so so the, there's, there's definitely room for that inside of Minecraft's own imagery already, but... I like the idea of the heavy core passing the beacon beam through it and opening up in the same way that a conduit does when it's fully powered. That seems like really evocative as an idea, regardless of what it does from that point onward. Feels very like, uh, you know, fifth element level of like mystical technology that uh, could be out there yeah. in the world. And I, I kind of agree with the, the, the idea behind the name being mysterious. Stuff like that exists in the game already. Like, the Nether Star is one of those things. That you beat the Wither, it drops a star. Like, th that on its own is such an odd concept. And mm. then you turn it into a beacon because the crafting recipe for one pops up. But I don't know if many people have really thought too hard about why, since the community has grown a lot since the Wither was first introduced, along with the beacons. I feel like... People these days would probably have, you know, hour-long video essays on why they think the Wither drops a star. <laughs> I think it's a really interesting idea when you've got new players to the game. It's something that all of us can't do is experience ourselves the first time you play Minecraft again. And the first time you encounter things like a Wither or a Beacon or a Shulker or that kind of stuff. And it, it would be really interesting to grab those first impressions from someone that gets an item that has a quirky name or for example even just to focus on the the, the heavy core it, again like you know the core of what like are they going to think about it in the same way that more experienced players would or would they just accept it like oh it's a heavy core like this if this is just the in-game item that i get and maybe they're not thinking past that and mm. I, I like the idea that there's more in the name as a suggestion because it keeps it from being, uh, I guess, preconceived or assumed by players that it's only going to have one thing. And like you said, Alraf, you know, leaves it open for potential building. And I think that's something that the team has been doing really well as of late, which is new stuff starts being added to the game. And then we'll go back and we'll bring in, you know, scoots and apply those to armadillos or we'll like, we'll grab other game mechanics and bring them forward i think what was the armadillos eat spider eyes like just little things like that that kind mm. of bring older parts of the game and make them a little bit more functional a little bit more useful going forward uh adding one more use to them than they used to have and i think that when you develop something like the heavy core that has that open-ended potential it's like those choose your own adventure books when you were a kid i'm not sure if you ever had those but it mm. i always really liked that idea that there wasn't just one way to go like you could read the book four or five different times and depending on the choices that you make you'd get a different ending and i feel like that's a, a fun way to develop a game that's as open-ended as minecraft and that you have that kind of yes and ability with this kind of stuff um I, I like the idea of a heavy core in a beacon. I'm only just now remembering that when you put an ingot in a beacon and then you decide to change the beacon, the ingot is consumed. Can't say that I'd want to go get multiple heavy cores <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. to, to do multiple beacons or to have a beacon change my mind. Whatever I did with that beacon would be a very careful decision that would I you know would make once. But the thing that I pulled from the email was as someone that's not super interested in PVE, uh, or necessarily the the efforts to go get a heavy core and a mace, I feel like having a beacon tied to it or some new thing like that, uh, whether it's the heavy core or something else tied to trial chambers or other you know in game events like that, uh, it brings an appeal to end game players that you can get the benefits of whatever the beacon changes are or the building changes or what, whatever the new thing is, if it applies to more than just PVE, then that pushes players that are like maybe not as inclined to go and experience that to say like, well, wait a minute, I really want that thing. I really want the ominous beacon. I really want to turn the sky 
dark you know your your brain went to fifth element johnny mine went to ghostbusters so yeah <laughs> like, like this, all that kind of stuff could could be really appealing to a broader base you know if there could be more uses for it I, and i think a beacon is one of those i guess unanimous or ubiquitous features in the game that everybody kind of knows what it is everybody likes the fact that they're around when they have them and elaborating on that i think kind of have has a universal appeal yeah i i think that's that's actually a really good point because i think it's really interesting uh it, it's sort of been solidifying over the last uh, few years in the design team here that we're talking about it's we, it's so important to us that we're trying to appeal to as many play styles in in uh, in our feature development and historically there was very much the trying to make every feature sort of appeal to as many players as we can and i think that something that was a, a bit of a evolution of that or thinking about that in an interesting new way is that there is actually a downside of making something appeal to more than one uh, uh, play style so let's say i make that the um, what is a really good thing builders want flying <laughs> okay <laughs> let's say you get the heavy core you put it on a beacon it lets you f create a fly in that area right you love that as a builder what i just did is make a builder pretty much have to or, or feel like they have to go to the trial chambers right right but if you think about it, a lot of builders don't want that. They don't like fighting, as you described yourself, right? Your, PvE is not your favorite thing. But I sort of, instead of letting you do your thing and enjoy your playstyle and maybe putting that cool item you want somewhere else in a building challenge, like by exploration maybe or by a puzzle, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to challenge builders, right? But... Um, Instead of that, I'm sort of sending you on an adventure that you don't really enjoy. So I think during uh, Deep Dark, for example, we talked a lot about this. What kind of reward are we putting here? And is it actually rewarding the right kind of player? Um, so I think there is something to be said about trying to match the reward to the kind of player that actually will be there. So that's why we were actually going for the mace, right? It's a very combat-heavy reward for... Whoever, who does the trial chambers, combat heavy players. Right. Uh, and, and things that are more geared towards uh, creative builders uh, type of players, I think we're trying to put it in places where either the challenge is not necessarily focused on combat, or at least it's not necessarily the harder, the most hard type of challenge. Because maybe that's not what you want to do. Um, it's it's a balance, of course, right? Because we want there's so many people who are generalists as well and love different things, uh, so it's a balance. But yeah, it's, I thought it was an interesting thought that we came to over the last few years. Yeah, it's something we picked up on in previous shows about how trial chambers are a combat experience and for combat focused players they're rewardingly deep in that they have the ominous layer to them now which is a whole separate thing if you enjoyed that trial chamber congratulations you get to do it again with harder mobs once you find one of the potion bottles so yeah. i think that's that's a really kind of well designed depth of feature for players who enjoy that kind of thing and for everybody else it's going to be a great resource to get hold of copper blocks i think yeah but uh, let's move on to talking about the mace, since you're here to chat to us about that, since it, it's, it seems to be something you put a lot of time and care into over the last little while. Um, it's the latest mm. addition to Minecraft's weapon set. Is it also perhaps its latest parkour tool? Uh, we, will, <laughs> we will find out. Some really interesting videos on that score. But um, before that, we want to set some of this against a bit of a backdrop. So before we start with the mace, since it's our first time chatting to you on the show, I wanted to hear a bit about how you first discovered minecraft because when we were talking in the pre-show you said you'd you'd been part of minecraft's broader community for something like 14 years now and we're in the 15th mm. year of minecraft so <laughs> you must have discovered it fairly early uh, yeah yeah i i think i don't remember everyone when they talk about the say the version i don't remember the version i can say that i remember that wooden slabs have been mined by pickaxe oh. when i started <laughs> right. so that's roughly where that is um, I, I think also I, I, I really like the story of how I started Minecraft because it's a very hum humbling experience that I'm trying to keep in my mind all the time. 
I basically heard about a lot of players or a lot of people around me playing it. I downloaded it, I tried it myself, and my first world ever that I opened, I spawned on a stony mountain or a stone patch on a mountain. So there was no trees, no dirt, no anything like that around me. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I, I play video games. I move my mouse. I know how to move a mouse. I place, I, I move around. Okay, let's try to break stuff, right? I play, press the buttons and I spent an hour. I'm sure it was an hour breaking a single stone block with my hand. <laughs> and the damn thing did not drop. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this man went on to develop Minecraft. <laughs> and, and this man said, this game is stupid. I am never playing this game again and closed it. <laughs> uh. And that's my first experience with Minecraft. And of course, uh, a while after that, I, I got invited by a friend to play with them. And that I loved so much. I think that the place I fell in love with Minecraft is creating creative things together pushing my friends off ledges doing pranks doing funny signs telling stories before i even called it stories it was more about our adventures in the game together was the story and i think that that is definitely what sold me on minecraft i remember that we had a spiral staircase going down to the mine that we filled with each layer had a sign that it was the next line in a song that we all kept singing like the staircase was so boring to go up and down that we kept singing the song every time we go up and down so someone wrote it on the walls like it's just yeah the simplicity of hanging out with friends is what made me really fall in love with minecraft that's awesome yeah i i remember the switch from xbox minecraft which i played for about six months back in 2014 and i loved the experience but i didn't have a great deal of friends who could also play on xbox and a lot of the people i knew who were playing w were on pc and when i got introduced to a server that ended up being the first place i made videos from it was such a different style of gameplay and the collaborative nature of it really open stuff up but i was looking forward to that already because my main complaint was how difficult it was to share anything i had done mm. from the xbox version of the game like if i wasn't playing multiplayer i had to i think upload a screenshot to a social media profile so i had to like post it to twitter or facebook or somewhere so that i could get the screenshot off my xbox and onto a pc where i could put it anywhere else i wanted to and so yeah it it felt really nice to be able to share what i was doing with other people and 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 experience stuff that they had created to be shared with with their friends yes i, I think that's how i sort of started as a player i think my journey as getting anywhere near development for minecraft was that before so i i wanted to be a game developer most of my life uh, but the the place I grew up in didn't really have much of a gaming industry so that didn't really happen for most of my life um, but before Mojang after a few weird adventures in the game development world I got to working with this amazing um, organization called Games for Peace shout out amazing non-profit uh, I don't, no, yeah, shout out is not going to help them. But if, if you're interested <laughs> in creating peace using video games, Google them and, and help them somehow. We can um, uh, include a link to any, any uh, web presence they have in our show notes if people want to go and check them out. Oh, that's a great idea. Yes, games for peace. I'll send a link for you. Um, but basically, it's a non-profit organization that uh, uses games to promote peace and bring kids from different... Uh, areas of conflict to play games together and break down that barrier of we are just enemies into no we are just people who happen to be on this different sides basically right um and i think just hearing about the, this organization it it resonated so much with me because i think i think most gamers know this like it's so natural for us and everyone who plays uh, multiplayer games i played a lot of league of legends when i was younger and so many times I would log into a game and someone is like, from, question mark, right? The, we, we don't have a lot of grammar in, in internet speak, but say from, question mark, and I would say, ah, uh, Israel. And he would say, ah, uh, Iran or some other place that supposedly we are enemies. But th the next immediate line will be, 
great, which role do you want to play? Like, how do we play together? And no one cares about those external things that are trying to make us enemies. And we're all just here to have fun and, and, and pass the time and enjoy each other's company. And I think gaming is such a great place to, to use, to, to try to bridge that gap of, of seeing the other side as just human, just like us, just wanting to have a good life sort of thing. So yeah, so I loved Games for Peace mission so much, and I sort of worked with them uh, creating Minecraft maps uh, to, to, to create those games that the kids would play and, and get to know each other through. That's incredible. Like, that's such a cool stepping stone to, obviously, like, your role now, but it seems like mm. a, an organization that, yeah, is, is needed more than ever. So I think that's, that's a really, Definitely. really important thing to highlight. So thank you for uh, bringing that to our attention. Joel has found the URL, so we can throw that in the, uh, the show notes for anybody listening as well. Um, so following up on your, your adventures making Minecraft maps, you then, uh, d does that lead to you modding stuff or were you just kind of dabbling in programming on the side and that led to finding an, an opening at Mojang? Um, how mm. did the, the Mojang sort of, the Mojang acquisition of Ulraf, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, did, how did that come together? So I, I actually didn't do modding before, before, uh, joining Mojang at all. I did programming a lot. I've been programming since I was like 10. Um, and I, and I did game development a lot before, but I haven't modded Minecraft before joining the team. Uh, I think I knew a lot about commands. I did a lot of data packs because I created maps. Uh, I did very slightly programming, uh, for like fun mods for myself, but not, not anything considerable. Um, but I worked a lot with Java code before I worked a bit with C++ before. So I had sort of a smooth transition coming into the code base for Minecraft. The, the story of how I got here is, a, is honestly, I, I, I don't, it's, it's deceptively simple. <laughs> like I, as a person, I'm not that big into pop culture and stuff. Like I don't. People have like rock stars they follow or movie stars they follow. And I generally don't recognize a name of anyone when you talk to me about it because that's not really my interest. My rock stars are like game developers. <laughs> so I've been following like Jeb and, uh, and Dinnerbone and Agnes and everything for many, many years uh, before this. And one day I saw a post from Agnes that they're looking for... Uh, gameplay developers it was called at the time and uh, basically it's a it's a team that's in in charge of working and creating new updates for minecraft and i got encouraged by a friend to send in my cv even though i was i i wasn't going to because <laughs> I, I felt so underqualified like i i mean i've been developing for like 18 years at that point and i've been game development for like nine years at that point, but it's just, it's Minecraft, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like it's my superstars. Like I couldn't even sit in front of Agnes and tell her, yeah. So, but, but again, I have good friends and they pushed me and I sent in my CV and I actually, yeah, I, I wrote, I remember writing, I spent days writing this personal letter about how much Minecraft means for me and how much I think it means for the world. And, like, because I have this experience with Games for Peace, right? I literally see this game bridging a gap for, for kids every day. So it was way more than just a game for me. Um, and I, I got invited to do video interviews because I'm away uh, in a different country. And I get an, an email invite to a questionnaire. And the questionnaire says, you're going to meet with someone named Mike. And I know a lot of... Minecraft developers, but none of them is named Mike. So I'm like, okay, it's going to be interesting. The, the camera turns on, and Mike is there, but across the table from him, Jeb is sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and I muted my mic and started hyperventilating. <laughs> 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 and then the funny thing happened was that they started by introducing themselves. <laughs> And I finished, waited quietly, and then they were like, okay, now you introduce yourself. And then I unmuted, and I said, it's very nice, I appreciate it, but you don't, <laughs> there is no need for you to introduce. I have been a huge fan for many, many years. I'm so excited to sit here in front of you. Um, and yeah, and we, we had, 
a very fun conversation. I remember Jens, one of the first things we talked about was role-playing games and uh, the different systems we play and why we play them and, and influences like that. And then I had another interview with uh, Dinner Room and, and Agnes. Again, it was very stressful, but they were so fun. They actually asked me, how would you design butterflies for Minecraft, which was such an interesting discussion. Um, yeah, and I was flown to Sweden for like more face-to-face -face interviews. And for some reason that I really cannot explain, I got accepted and my life pretty much changed completely after that. And now we have the mace, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and it's all thanks to your friends pushing you to uh, to to you know apply to this position. That's that's awesome. Well, we we feel like now we've got a bit of uh, Ulraf's origin story. We need to really hear the mace's origin story. And you've talked mm. a bit about sort of whipping up the prototype of this relatively quickly, but uh, let's go back a little further than that. How do you pitch something like the mace? How was it originally? broken as a feature and uh once you've kind of got the the idea of we want to add in something like the mace to the game what are the challenges in creating it mm. that was really interesting actually because i i wasn't actually supposed to even develop the mace what happened was that uh the the update team was working about the update working on the trials working on the breeze and we were talking and we felt like we need some sort of unique reward for this. We have such a good challenge, such a good uh, experience already. We need something to really reward players who take on this, this uh, challenge on themselves. And uh, I was brought in to help out just because we were a bit uh, stressed with the current features. So I was like, okay, what if I prototype some ideas for what this reward can be and then you guys you choose the the reward the idea you like the most and you run with it and we prototyped a bunch of different things we prototyped a bunch of different either weapon ideas we prototyped uh different potion ideas we, we prototyped a bunch of different ideas for what the reward could be um i can't really talk about those ideas because they might come in the future who knows uh but i think a lot of them, so what I was told for what am I prototyping is it needs to be a worthwhile reward, something worth the challenge of the trials, and it needs to fit the theme of the trials and the wind charge and the breeze, like somehow make it feel like I'm not just taking something from somewhere else and slapping it here, right? It needs to feel at home here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my first prototypes were sort of really tightly connected like um, something that you load a wind charge into, right? Or something you craft out of a wind charge and stuff like that. Uh, but I was thinking about all my different ideas. Some of them were good. Some of them were less. We were playing with them. There were some exciting ideas, uh, but nothing felt really to click sort of thing. And then I had the idea of what if instead of creating something that is tightly connected with the wind charge, it's sort of just uh, by way of interaction, by way of like sandbox mechanics, they work well together, right? And that sort of brought me to, okay, the wind charge, what it does, it lets you uh, jump up in the air and not take fall damage when you do. What if we had something that capitalized on it? And that's where the mace idea came from, right? It's already taking an existing mechanic in the game that falling down does more damage and cranking that into 11 basically now every block you fall enhances the damage even more and that works quite well by itself but if you have a wind charge now everywhere has difference in terrain right everywhere uh, enables you to to jump and get those smash attacks and i think i remember like thinking about this idea and immediately getting extremely excited and like running to to try it out immediately. Like I couldn't wait until I talked to the team about it. I just needed to have it in the game and play it out. And in the matter of like very little time, it was functional in a way that I could play with it. Of course, nowhere near ready to go into the game, but functional so I could feel it. And I even had already the idea of the, the wind burst enchantment. So I made it so when you hit with a, with a weapon, it creates an explosion underneath you, so you're sort of bouncing away. Uh, and it was just, it sort of felt so good immediately. And I think I was so excited about it because I think the things I always am so excited about are the things that are the simplest sort of thing. 
I feel this is, I can explain the idea of the mace in one sentence, right? You do more damage, the further you fall. And that immediately talks to me about this is going to fit so well into the sandbox of Minecraft. I am sure the players are going to find so many cool ideas to do with this. And they did. I don't, did you guys see the, the Ender Pearl wind charge uh, trick? No, I haven't seen that yet. I, d I did see the video, I think you reposted it on Twitter, of people using it as like a two-player parkour course where they're hitting each other that with the, so the wind burst mace to try and like climb up certain areas. But I, I haven't seen the Ender Pearl trick. Can you explain that for us? So the Ender Pearl wind charge trick is you throw one of them, let's say you throw an Ender Pearl up in the air, and then you throw a wind charge exactly in the same direction. So the wind charge hits the ender pearl, which procs it, so you teleport to the air, and then fall down and kill your enemy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's wild. Right, like, that's I, amazing. I can visualize that happening in my head, and it's the most absurd, like, trick shot stuff, which is exactly. entirely what I was hoping for from the mace when it first came up, because I was like, yeah, people are going to be doing those old school challenges where you like jump off a block at build height and hit a ladder that's like down by the exactly. void wearing a pumpkin on your head doing a 360 like <laughs> there are going to be so many goofy like like pool trick shots that people are going to do with the mace that's awesome exactly exactly i've seen that there was a one that says now that the mace saves you from taking fall damage i've seen someone do a, it's called chicken clutch so you throw an egg while you're falling, you hope the egg spawns a chicken, and then you hit the chicken before you flow, falls to not take fall damage and stuff like that, right? And, and, and then you get one of those eggs that spawns four chickens, and you're like, ah, yes. oh, I have too many choices. <laughs> and that's, that's, that, those sort of things, though, the second I knew that I'm adding something that is so, so simple, I immediately know that I can't even imagine all the things the community is going to find, all the different interaction it's going to have right and i think that's what's got me so excited about this that after showing it to the team and seeing there is some like it's not me right i'm not crazy other people like it as well i went basically to our team manager and i was like listen i know we agreed i only research this and you guys develop it and i, I move on to the next project that i need to go to but I need to work on this. <laughs> like yeah. this is, I'm so passionate about this. So I, I ended up staying with the team a bit further and, and working out the kinks. A lot of things changed. For example, originally you weren't negating fall damage. You would take fall damage. And I was like, yeah, but you still have feather falling or maybe you do something else or stuff like that. Uh, but that didn't feel, it didn't feel so polished. It feels so much better when you're like, if you hit this, you get a uh, fall damage uh, cancellation. Another thing that changed is that we, we made it so when you hit, your f downward momentum is cancelled. So you're sort of getting this, almost like you're slow down in midair for a second before you keep falling, which is also something that came out later. A lot of small tweaks that came out afterwards. I think of it like Looney Tunes level physics, right? Where yes. like, you know, Bugs Bunny is going to like smack something with a mallet. His legs are going out to either side, but like he can he can fall on something from a great height. Or it's like a Wile E. Coyote kind of situation where like, yeah, you, you smack something hard enough with a hammer and the force just all transfers and you're perfectly fine after it. And yeah, that rules. And it's so great to hear that both that you were so passionate about it to begin with, that you were like, I need to see this through to its conclusion. This is my my new child that I need yeah. to, to take care of and feel stewardship over. But also the fact that the team internally is flexible enough that you can ask to do that and they just say yes. I think mm. that's that's a, a sign of a really great like working culture at Mojang that you can be flexible enough in your roles that they can spare you to work on something that is your passion project at that point. Yeah, exactly. I think we're... I think there is something we're really trying to do in Minecraft, in Mojang, because there are so many people here who are extremely passionate about the game. It's really, as much as possible, sort of have people work on what they're passionate about. But I think we also know that when you work on something you're passionate about, the feature comes out better, basically. With you now being more involved from the original conception of the Mace to being you know, part of the team that's working on it, how involved were you in the look of the final mace, the, the model as it appears uh, as a traditional Minecraft pixel sprite versus uh, a more extruded model like the, the Trident? Was that something that you mm -hmm. were involved in? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's something that uh, the designer and the artists basically work together on. The final decisions on on visuals are always in the hand of art, uh, but that's something we we talked quite a lot about. And I've seen I've seen that it's a bit controversial out there. I think part of why it's controversial is because people already sort of see what the heavy core looks like as 3D when you place down. Uh, I even think that might have been a mistake. I'm not sure. We're going to talk about it in the team after the update, but I feel like maybe I made a mistake that I made that a placeable item. Maybe it should have been staying stayed as an item, and then there was a bit less of this conflicting notion in your head, should it be 2D, should it be 3D? Uh, but I think I was really excited about the idea of the core being its own reward, right? If you don't like combat and you're still doing this, you don't care about the mace, you still get some decorative trophy that you get, right? And I really like the heavy core being that item. So I wanted it to be a placeable. But yeah, I think it. there was a lot of talk about should this to be a 2D or 3D. And eventually uh, the decision was made to make it not extruded like the trident. Although the trident itself is also, a lot of people are like, why is it not like the trident? The trident itself is one pixel extruded, right? It's still, it's, it's as 2D as possible while still being 3D sort of thing. Right. Um, and and the mace every every sort of uh we did some internal playtesting and trying out 3D but also everything you see online everything is much much more than that right it's not one uh pixel wide like the trident would be it's like at least 8 or 9 pixel wide and i think that every time we played that inside the game what we felt is that was basically breaking something fundamental in the um, the visuals of Minecraft. If you saw a screenshot of this, you're more likely to think that this is from Legends or from Dungeons, basically. Um, because that fits their art style a lot more. And Minecraft has something very magical about its simplicity and, and about how this sort of looks when you compare it to a pickaxe being held in your hand, to a sword being held in your hand, uh, to a shovel being held in your hand. Um, and and we made up the decision that sort of in the grand scheme of every other item that we have in this broader picture, this looks better. This looks more Minecrafty, basically. Yeah, my my theory about it was that yeah, it was the flat sprite just kind of extruded by one pixel because that looked similar to how a sword looks. But also, if you make it a 3D model, it starts to look like a placeable block again, right? Like mm. anything that you're holding in your hand that is three-dimensional like that is because that's what it looks like when you place it in the world. True. And so, yeah, the idea that you're looking at something in your hand that's a 3D model, but you can't put it down feels wrong somehow. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you went through a few iterations with that. And I think it'll be interesting for people to hear that because I think there is this misconception a lot of the time that when you put out the playable version of the mace in snapshots for the first time that's also the first pass on design and it's quite mm. clear that that's not the case like you've done a bit no. of internal design play testing beforehand and and tried out the stuff that people think is you know obvious quote unquote about how the mace should look definitely definitely we we've had a few iterations uh around the the look of it for sure and i think it's so interesting to me what you said because many times when we talk about this elusive subject of what is Minecrafty. It's quite hard to explain. It's more of an intuition many times. Uh, and I think that what you're saying is something that I didn't consciously think about, Like, but it's totally true. Most of the things you see that are 3D in your hand are blocks, right? Are things you can place. Yeah. And I think that when I saw the mace being held in the hand and something felt off about it, I, it was hard for me to put in words. I'm guessing our artists did think about it and just didn't tell me, right? Like, they, they do go through these very in-depth... Uh, but I knew I feel something wrong, even if I can't give words to it. And I think what you're saying is a big part of that. Yeah, you have, like, there's a disturbance in the force, and you're like, something exactly. feels off, I just can't tell. Well, aside from the look of the mace, I saw a couple of major reactions that you might call a controversy, but I think it's just people kind of, like giving their feedback on on a brand new feature people thought it was very fun to use and thought that it was going to be nerfed immediately <laughs> because <laughs> it it can theoretically kill anything in one hit uh, so yep. what was the decision making behind that and how difficult it is is it to balance a weapon like this and what led to it effectively keeping the ability to one shot stuff like the ender dragon or the wither 
That that is very difficult. I think the hardest part about the development of the maze for me, and and a lot of, if we if we can get a bit personal, a lot of my stress for the last few months have been that. Right, have been. A lot of people are very respective, and I think there is a lot of very good feedback going on. But there's also a lot of people who are not very nice in the way they give feedback or in how much IQ they assume I have as the person developing this. <laughs> um, but I think that was the hardest part, balancing this, because there's sort of conflicting use cases for this. Um, and I think even internally, many people were talking about, should we have a cap for the damage, right? Even before we release this at all. And I think I opted up to not having a cap, at least for the first snapshot, right? I was open to reconsidering this later. But for the first snapshot, I was like, no, we're not going to have a cap because I just want to see how, from one angle is how broken it is, but honestly, how fun this is. Yeah. Right. Because the, the amount of videos we saw after is that are all meme video videos, right? Of like, haha, I did this and it's so funny. Those are really fun, right? <laughs> Going back to my story about how I fell in love with Minecraft, pushing your friend off a cliff is fun <laughs> right like doing pranks is such so much part of minecraft's charm that's the quote we're going to put at the top of the show notes by the way pushing your friends <laughs> off a cliff is fun all right 2024 <laughs> <laughs> it definitely definitely is and i think that many times we get in our head about uh, gamifying and trying to make it so balanced that we're putting sort of limits that are 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 a player wouldn't sort of expect this limit and it's immediately stifened your excitement from it and creativity. Like imagine a player doing a smash attack and being like, whoa, I got this damage from five blocks. How much is it from 300 blocks? Doing that and getting disappointed that it's the same because there's a cap. Yeah, sure. Right? Like just, I think so many times that's what games would do. Sacrificing the craziness and fun for this sort of uh, balance concerns. And I think that on the other scale of things, you see games like, the first thing that comes to my head is like uh, Goat Simulator, right? That they sort of allow themselves to be crazier and, and opt into, yeah, you break the game with this feature, but it's so much fun. And I have to be somewhere in the middle because <laughs> I want this fun and I want this excitement and creativity and I definitely want to keep things unbounded because that's where the sandbox becomes so interesting and and that's what minecraft is i think um but at the same time i don't want to ruin the fun of our pvp community and i don't want to ruin the fun of people using other mechanics and other strategies i don't want to make the sword useless or the axe useless as a weapon right or the trident or everything else i think Balance here is important, but it's not important for balance sake. It's important to not take away from other fun things in the game. And that's been my focus. Uh, it was very much on how do I keep the maze feeling extremely strong and fun when you land it, right? That's sort of what kept me in line. I wrote down a bunch of these uh, design intent, design pillars, I call them that keep me on the right track. And one of them was the mace is a high skill, high reward, uh, high, high risk, high reward, high skill uh, ceiling weapon. It's aimed at pretty competent combat players, right? Otherwise you won't have it because you get it after a big challenge. So I can allow myself to say, you're risking a lot when you're doing a crazy hit here, right? You're risking death basically. So if your risk is so high, and then I can give you a really big good reward if you succeed. And, but I think a lot of people don't see that because you, you see a video of someone one-shotting the wither and you don't see that person 20 times falling to their death yeah. trying to capture that video, <laughs> right? Yeah, or or they or they're setting it up in creative, so and the wither is staying suspiciously still, and you yeah, know, there's there, there's so many situations in which that could go wrong, and and like like most things on the internet, you're seeing the one time that the the bottle flip pays off, you know, you're seeing the <laughs> exactly. you're seeing the one the the no look, uh, you know, three pointer from the halfway line, like it's it's so easy to see those things and not play test them for yourself and think, well, this is clearly overpowered when 
the actual circumstances that you're going to be able to pull those off are going to be rare enough that it's still going to feel rewarding. Exactly, exactly. The same thing, by the way, came up when we were talking about the new particle effects. Uh, some people were like, isn't this too much? Isn't it going to be like blocking your view? Isn't it going to be like, oh, players doing smash all around you and the entire room is full of particles and you can't see anything? And I'm like, guys, guys, let's... Have you tried this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, try this in a room. Around 9 out of 10 of your tries are not a smash attack, right? Like, it's hard. It's hard to pull off. And you can have four players in the same trial chamber room. The time until they have a chance to do a smash attack versus just attacking, and the time they actually land it is so much spaced apart, you're not going to have four smash attacks all the time around you. Right, so I think we can allow ourselves to go crazy and do a really fun sound, a really excessive uh, particle. So your friend seeing you fall down really gets the feeling of, bam, that was an impressive, cool thing you just did. Yeah, you, you want to be able to feel like a Marvel superhero or see your friend do something like that, that kind of, yeah, it mm. looks looks like they just ended the world for whatever it was they were hitting. And that's that's fun. Yeah. I, like, I love the fact that the spirit of that stuff is still being kept alive and it takes us like one step closer to being as wacky as the April Fool's snapshot stuff, but yeah. with something that still feels like it has a foundation in the vanilla game. Exactly. When you have a... A development cycle like we have now with the minor and major updates and the experimental features that give features like the mace longer brewing time with players to mess around with and give you feedback what does that process look like for something that has to be so delicately handled uh, ironically <laughs> considering it's such <laughs> a, a, a massive weapon um when you've got that much feedback coming, because obviously like a new weapon in Minecraft, like that garners a lot of attention. And mm. when you have a longer, we'll say public facing uh, development cycle, is, is that a good thing? Or or does the amount of feedback you get become overwhelming at times? Mm, that's a good question. I... I, th I I mean both right it it can be overwhelming sometimes and I think it really depends as well on your where I am sort of thing I think I I've, I've had a, a bit of a personal life things happening in the last few months that sort of made things everything else feels a bit harder as well right so I think it can be really overwhelming there's a lot of people like we said that are a bit less delicate with the way they give their feedback but at the same time, there's also so many people who just love the game and just want... They're looking for a reason to get excited, right? Like I am, right? Anything you put on Minecraft, I get excited. Um, and and I think that also really fills you up and really brings back the motivation for why we're doing all of this and why we're working so hard. And I, I haven't been involved with a public feature for quite a long time before this. I was working on a, a lot of internal things. I was helping other internal teams in the company that don't really have uh, game design support mostly. So I was really trying to, we're trying to do some steps to bring Vanilla closer to the rest of the organization. Uh, vanilla is the Vanilla game, obviously. Um, so I, I've, I've been far away from the community and community feedback for quite a long time. So part of me was really definitely missing this with, with all the downside, with all the nasty comments and nasty messages. It's really great seeing people get excited seeing people laugh and 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 react so positively pix watching you on stream for the first time you one shot at the iron golem like that yeah. was so fun to see your excitement um so yeah just on the personal side it is overwhelming but at the same time it's really fulfilling as well on the more professional side i think it's definitely helping us a lot like i think when we talked about we're we're doing the maze quite close to release right we're we don't have that much left for this update. Uh, and when we talked about do we have enough time to add a new feature like the mace or not, a definite consideration there was how many snapshots slash betas we have with this feature. So how long is it going to, for us to be ready for a first snapshot? And how long can we be out to make sure we react to feedback on this? And for a weapon, it was very important. Like we would not allow 
a weapon to be developed if it's done on the release, <laughs> right? Because it's so important to us that that sort of combat interactions f- make we make sure we don't break anything su- substantial in people's experience. So we we had this a bit longer lead up time from uh, the first snapshot and until when it's going to be ready. And that was crucial uh, for us to make sure we're doing this in a good way. And by the way, there's things that have been affected by this, right? Like uh, uh, the Elytra, for example, not not working uh, with uh, with conjunctions with a mace, right? Uh, is something that definitely was inspired by community feedback. Um, various tweaks, various things that. Uh, around the enchantments, there is also some tweaks we're still working on that might come out uh, soon. So it's definitely I spent a lot of my time going over feedback on the different um, outlets like uh, Reddit versus Twitter versus Discord. By the way, you can definitely see different winds blowing. Like you can see different trends in. You can see that people in a group tend to conform to one general direction so you can see twitter saying oh this is crazy too strong and it's not interesting and has to be nerfed and at the same exact time 90 percent of reddit is like no this is really great like this is actually not breaking anything uh, or pvp is like doesn't care about this anyway because nothing is going to take away uh crystal explosion pvp right that's the prevailing pe- meta right now um so it's really definitely a lot of our time is invested in listening to community feedback, deciding and prioritizing what what do we have time to react to and what is the most important things to react to. Um, and, and we take that in our considerations when we're planning our work because we, we want this. We, we develop Minecraft with the community. We care so much about the community in this. I think one of the things that I'm sure you would develop uh, an ear for with some of that negative feedback, especially inside of those echo chambers like Twitter, would be comments that are so obviously coming from people that haven't actually tried it. They're just Mm. jumping on the train. There's not a lot of substance where if somebody is critical of it, but then gives reasons like I tried this and it was too easy to do or or this kind of thing, I, I feel like at least as developers, it would be hopefully over time easier to pick out the uh the diamonds of criticism from the chaff and be just like all right well i don't have to worry about this no. person just barking for the sake of barking whereas like this actually had some thoughtfulness to it and you can compare like the negative comment to the positive comment that you might get on reddit of somebody that has actually played and is really enjoying you know one shotting a wither even though it took 40 tries uh exactly yeah I, that would be a great like super edit of like 39 deaths or misfires or like catastrophes, <laughs> you know, and then the final clip is the got him finally, you know, that, that I think could be, it's akin to, uh, super time lapses and stuff for builders where you have to remind yourself, I just watched five and a half hours of, of building and decisions in a minute and a half, <laughs> you know? And so I have to not yeah. beat myself up for my builds taking so long. And I think that when you show off either a powerful, new weapon or a technique or something that is illustrated to be, I use air quotes there, overpowered. Uh, mm. What's not being shown is just as important as what is being shown. And, and like you said, I think we even talked about it, Pixel, on one of the shows. We're like, this is all great if you're just jumping in an iron golem in a pit. But if I'm trying to hit Pixel Rifts and he's running around, like, <laughs> I'm not going to have that skill. Like, that's going to be, hopefully Pix just doesn't see me. <laughs> crouching yeah, above exactly. him like Batman <laughs> before I drop in, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely a big part of, of uh, our reactions with the community is trying to sift out. And, and you can clearly see it when I'm looking at hundreds of comments in a row. You can see how closely resembling the phrasing is to the point where I can be like, Okay, which YouTuber said this exact sentence? Yeah. <laughs> right? This is word for word. Uh, it's just, yeah, so it's, it's quite clear that a lot of people are just saying that. But again, I, I really don't want it to come off as I'm being bitter by this at all. Because I know no, there's of course. so many people who don't. So many people who really care. Like you see in their message, even when they're angry, it's because they care about the game so much, right? Otherwise, they don't get angry. Like it's... 
I really appreciate it. It's what I'm trying to say. I, I really, I, I would appreciate it if people were nicer, but, but other than that, I really appreciate the feedback. I really appreciate the people posting it. Um, I can say though, I think I thought about it recently and I tried to phrase it in a Twitter post and I, I stopped myself cause I couldn't find, I'm, I think I'm a much more eloquent person in, uh, in voice rather than in text. Um, I babble a bit, but other than that, I think I'm a bit <laughs> eloquent. Um, and it's hard for me to communicate in text sometimes. But what I wanted to say was there is this super common uh, tip that every game designer first year knows. But for some reason, for the average person, it's really not obvious. And that is 90% of useful feedback you get on, on a feature, on an idea, on anything game, game design related is problems solutions are almost never helpful honestly because as a player you almost never know what is the experience that the designer is trying to create and almost always when i see someone suggest a solution what i do is completely ignore the solution and try to understand what are they trying to solve so i can understand what the problem is and then i can come up with a solution Right, like it's so much. Every time I see a comment that says "I played," this was my experience. This is what felt bad. That is infinitely more useful to me than the maze should have less damage. G great. Why? What, like, what are you trying to achieve? What is? <laughs> what did you feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like you, you want the feedback to be like experiential. Like you want it to be what kind of experience the person had, and exactly. yeah, maybe the results of that, but not necessarily how they would like to experience it differently. <laughs> and mm. yeah, that's 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 a really interesting point. And uh, yeah, I, I think we are basically getting close to our wrap up time, so we should probably wrap things up there. But we'll keep the recording rolling, and we might uh, d dive into a few more of those thoughts in the post show for our patrons. But for now, that's going to wrap up this episode of The Spawn Chunks. Olraf, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an incredible discussion, and I hope the audience has got a kick out of it. Uh, is there anything like you'd like to promote before you go? Uh, do you want people to send some of that experience to you on social hmm. media, or do you have anything else that you'd like to plug? Uh, I mean, if, if you want to talk to me about Minecraft or anything uh, like that related, you can talk to me on Twitter. I think that's the best place. My comments are still open, even after... Everything we've had in the last few <laughs> years, they're still open for anyone. So feel free to talk to me and I'm really interested in seeing. I don't respond to everything, but I read everything. Um, so that's uh, Twitter slash underscore Ulraf underscore. Uh, we said at the beginning I have a Twitch. Unfortunately, it has, isn't as uh, active as I would want it. But you're, you're welcome to go there as well. I do secret streams sometimes, uh, sometimes with Pixel Rifts as well. Yes, uh, I think the VOD of the Poisonous Potato Update stream is still going to be up there for a few more days, so uh, I, I highly recommend people go and check that out, because it's amazing from all four of our perspectives. Mm, it was very, very fun. Yeah, and thank you for having me here as well. It's always a pleasure talking to you guys about this. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, for us, you can find more information about the show, links to some of the stuff we talked about today, and of course, all of the links to Ulraf on the interwebs at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show is composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud as ever to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can visit patreon.com slash thespawnchunks to join our community, where pledging at any level will get you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can listen to the show live when we don't have guests who we're recording in a separate call with, and our monthly Minecraft audio hangouts also happen in there. We also had a quarterly hangout recently where we went into the behind the scenes facts and figures of the podcast and that should be popping up in the RSS feeds very soon. We currently have 322 patrons in our community which is down one from last week but there is always room for more. Special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager and Yitz. Thank you for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spun Chunks on social media. New episodes are available on Mondays on all of the major podcasting platforms. That includes YouTube. You can email the show once again at spunchunkmail at gmail.com. Don't forget about those one sentence episode 300 questions. The RSS feed is linked at thespawnchunks.com, and the patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast. 
My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixel Riffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixel Riffs, where I'm currently digging a very large hole on Minecraft SOS, and the Minecraft Survival Guide is currently in its third season. I also stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for the aforementioned YouTube series, and I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixel Riffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I'm doing online can be found at joelduggan.com. That includes a link to the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. I'm Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream scheduled Thursday through Sunday, but I've been pressing to finish West Hill, so I've been pushing up extra days. Mostly detail work, so if you're interested in little path designs and gardening and those kind of details, pop on by. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, and that's pretty amazing.